today that are really excited to hear uh, what our fantastic speakers have to say. So I would like to introduce our keynote, Amir Ganad. Amir is a leadership coach, a sought-after keynote speaker throughout the world, and the founder of the Ganad Group, which offers coaching and consulting services, especially in the areas of leadership effectiveness and culture transformation. Amir has held global leadership positions with Procter & Gamble, Sunny Delight Beverages, and Campbell Soup Company. Amir has a unique ability to lead and rally teams around a common vision. He is also a registered corporate coach and an accomplished trainer of, courses, of courses such as Seven Habits of Highly Effective People, The Speed of Trust, The Mind Gym, and more. Amir is not all business, however. He once sang a Thai song with a live band in front of a thousand people, so you might have to ask him to sing for us. Amir holds a bachelor's and master's of science in mechanical engineering from the Georgia Institute of Technology and an MBA from Wilmington University. Amir and his wife of 33 years, Connie, live in Atlanta, Georgia. What I'd especially like to highlight about Amir is that he has just recently launched his book called The Transformative Leader, which is for sale here today at the conference. This book focuses on how we can transform ourselves before we can focus on transforming the culture of our organization. So without further ado, please welcome me in, join, in welcoming, please join me in welcoming Amir. Thank you. All right, thank you. Uh, great to be with you today. Testing? Aha. Uh -huh. Okay. Wow. I'm a leadership expert who has a problem with flipping switches. So. <laughs> okay. Now that we got that out of the, question, out of the way. Uh, so I am really, really delighted to be with you here today. It is absolutely an honor. I uh, really, uh, as uh, Amber's uh, generous uh, you know, introduction said, I, I've had some experience with leadership and that sort of thing, but I have probably learned more from my mistakes and things that I shouldn't do than I have uh, about anything else. Uh, you've heard a few, uh, learned a few lessons in um, the School of Hard Knocks. Anybody else learn any of those? Yeah, sounds good. So, uh, but, uh, and, and, and I'm, I really absolutely love to share that with you. But one thing that I would like to tell you, uh, first of all, is the story behind the Thai song. Right, and um, it, it's basically I was working in Thailand, and uh, in my operation we had a huge challenge in uh, delivering a certain result. So I set a really, really high goal, and I said, if you guys deliver this for uh, three months in a row, I will sing at the company event. Well, first month, I mean, this word got out, and everybody, I mean, they they hit it. It was awesome. I'm thinking, okay, well, that's really great, but they might miss it a little bit. I can't, it was kind of a bittersweet thing. But second month, they hit it. Third month, I started practicing, right? <laughs> so uh, anyway, uh, make a long story longer. Uh, there were about 1,000 people, and, and what I did was uh, there was a live band behind me, and I sang a, a Thai song in front of everybody. So, uh, and, and please don't ask me to do that again. Be nice to other people that are in the room. All right, so uh, anyway, but uh, all joking aside, and, and some of you are like, was there a joke involved here? And, and I appreciate it, guys. I, I recruited some people. I said, if in doubt, uh, if you feel like there's a remote joke in the message, please do laugh. And, and I always say that's always good for me for a couple of reasons. One is kind of boosts my ego. The second thing is my daughter, who is my business partner, is in the back of the room today and uh, assisting me. And I'm telling you, I have a son and a daughter. Some of you may be able to relate to this. And they absolutely are convinced that my jokes are not funny, like all their lives. A and I would really like to prove her wrong. So <laughs> work with me. All right. So um, my, uh, you know, I, basically my background and my experience somehow has brought me, uh, I started in, in the technical field, but somehow I followed my passion and it has brought me to a point where I have a tremendous amount of passion and I engage 
during work hours and after hours and on weekends on basically uh, spreading the word of transformation, just best that I know, not instructions like this is what you should do, but things that I've learned and things like that. And this is why, you know, I'm really, really excited about my book. Um, it finally has come to fruition after writing thousands and thousands of uh, post-it notes and, and putting them everywhere. My daughter, Nassim, finally uh, was fed up and about five months ago said, look, we're going to actually make this happen because you get a message out for, for folks out there. And, and to me, this is a book that I really wish I had when I started my career about 30 years ago in manufacturing uh, because those people who were victimized by my leadership at, at that time, and I actually have gone back and, and apologized to some of those people and thanked them for putting up with me and, and really teaching me a lot. But uh, basically, I'll tell you a little bit more about it as we go. But today, in today's presentation, today's conversation, I want to cover some of the top lines of what's in the book, which essentially has to do with the mindset of leaders and the, the foundational principles. Not a whole bunch of go do this and do this, because we do a lot of that. But really, what does it take for you to transform yourself, wherever you are in your journey? Now, we have people in the room who are students, who, are, who have limited experience in the workforce. We have experienced people. We have educators here. So we have a wide range of people here, right? Uh, but what I want to talk to you about today it is not really particular to any, any group of people. So I would really ask you to sort of uh, listen and participate uh, from wherever you are and just say, how does that really apply to me? Okay, now how many people, just so I know, how many of you were at the Shingo conference uh, this past uh, year or a few months ago? Okay, got it, got it, super. I just really wanted to check because uh, there are some of those uh, topics that I covered uh, there that I wanted to include for those who weren't here, but I wanted to make sure that it wasn't too boring for all of those who, who were there. So if you were there, I would just say um, the first time you were a victim, the second time you were a volunteer. It's not my fault, so uh, you got to put up with it. So uh, thanks for being here. The session objectives that I stated here, I, I really want to get into examining the unique role of leaders, particularly as it uh, relates to servant leadership in transforming the culture and the results of an organization. Okay, so this is the, the main message of the, of the uh, conversation. Uh, not, not presentation, by the way. I'd really like to think of this as a, part of a conversation. So I'm going to ask you some questions from time to time, and I'd like you to participate like from where you are. So if I ask you a question, I'd like you to answer it. Is that a good deal? Can we do that? Yes. yes. See, some of you are still trying to figure out, maybe you can blend into the crowd. So what I'd like you to um, assume is you and I are the only people in the room. Okay, can we do that? Not, not y'all. If I ask you a question, it's not y'all like we say in Atlanta. But you, I'm asking you a question, so participate with me. Can we do that? Yes. Very good. Thank you very much. The second thing that I really want to do, which is really the overarching reason why I take this message out on the road, is to compel and empower you personally to move beyond the constraints of the past, whatever stopped you before, to, to really to get to that next level of not just performance, but fulfillment. Okay, so that's basically what this is all about. Now, I also know, those of you who have been to my presentations know that I always give people a couple of watch outs. There are three things that are working against me. One, you're hardly ever present. Like, you know, you're, you're somewhere else. Your body's here, but you know, you know how it is, right? You daydream and you, but when you find yourself there, just come back. Okay, don't make yourself wrong. We, we all do it, you know? Even as I'm speaking up here, I'm kind of somewhere else sometimes, right? But I'm gonna come back, I promise you. The second thing is, <laughs> the second thing is some of the things we're going to talk about you're not going to hear. You, you like literally won't hear it because your brain is wired that way to keep you from hearing everything around you. If you're at a party, you're talking to somebody, right? And, and you're fo focusing on that conversation, you block everything out. But if somebody says your name and you know they're talking about you, you immediately pick it up. Isn't that right? So the same thing is true in this conversation. So just so kind of watch out. The third thing is that even when you are here and you hear what we talk about, uh, you're not going to believe anything I'm going to tell you. Okay? I'm, I'm certain of that. In fact, you never believe anything anybody tells you. Because you believe what you say to yourself about what they just said. 
See, a, a minute ago you were like, what the heck is this guy talking about? Do we have to put up with this for 50 more minutes? What the and now you're saying, oh, okay, I get it. See, you're having this internal dialogue constantly that's telling you that's right, that's wrong, I believe that, I'm going to do this, I can't do this, you know, all of that, right? So I can't even get a word in edgewise because you guys are talking to yourself so much. You see, <laughs> that's what's going on, really. <laughs> you know, right? And, and, and if you really listen for about two seconds, you, you hear the little voice, sounds just like you, very intelligent, right? <laughs> Right? But here's the thing. It, most of the time, it doesn't have a lot of good things to say. Right? So you, you come up with a good idea. You hear something. You're like, oh, man, I'm going to try that. Your little voice like, who do you think you are? You think you're going to make that happen? In that case, you just say thanks for sharing, and you move on. Right? So, so whatever you do, one of the things that your little voice is going to tell you, I assure you, is, is going to be even if you find some things interesting in this conversation, your little voice is going to say, that's a good idea. We should do that someday, right? But you know you're not going to do that, right? Because your someday list is so long, if someday ever gets here, it better be six months long. I mean, let's admit it, right? Anybody else like me like that? Yeah, see, we participate. There you go. Awesome. So, you know, there's a restaurant in Atlanta called Joe's Crab Shack. They got this uh, outside, and because of that principle, they have not yet served a free crab yet. You know, so it's because... Tomorrow never comes, right? So you've got to <laughs> you've got to watch out with what's going on. Now, um, you know one of the reasons that I'm so passionate about this topic. Let's just jump into it uh, to empower leaders and and that sort of thing. Is that there are some staggering statistics out there that says people, not just in the U.S. but all over the world, are disengaged. They're disempowered. People go to work. Right. And and, you know, for the most part, you know, you have a, a small percentage of people that are engaged, some that are disengaged and, and some people who basically are actively sabotaging. Now, if you look at the, the global numbers, it's not a whole lot better. OK, so so why is this conversation important? It's because it is it has such significance to the lives of people around the world. Right now, I don't want to sound like Miss America and talk about world peace. But what I'm going to tell you is I fully believe that if we were to create workplaces that were a source of prosperity and inspiration rather than a place where you go and then you go home and kick the dog, this world would be a much better place. And what better avenue to actually go and influence that than to work with leaders who touch many, many lives? Okay, so this is the significance of this topic to me and why it, this is so important. Now, I, uh, I happen to have the good fortune uh, last week of uh, being invited to the White House. I, I uh, participated in, a, uh, in an event called Worker Voice, okay? And the president actually had, uh, you know, hosting this thing. He spent a few hours with us. Now, you know perhaps that the reason I'm telling you that is to impress you. Right? So let's get that out of the way. Like, that guy was at the White House? Wow. Right? But there's another reason I'm telling you this is that, you know, it was a cool experience, really awesome. Um, but, but the other reason I'm telling you this is because I tell you, it just hit me like a ton of bricks. It was like it reinforced to me how badly we need a message of transformation for leaders around this country, at least if not uh, the world. Why? Because there, was so, there were so many people there who were, who were really advocates for, uh, you know, workers' voice and so on and so forth. And while the focus of the conversation was a lot on sort of arming the workers to make sure they have a voice through organizing and things like that, which absolutely makes perfect sense in, in certain cases, I walked away thinking, wow, wouldn't it be great if we supplemented that with leadership development? And things like making sure that leaders are not just looking at their people as instruments and things like that, but as whole people and things like that. So it just really reinforced to me that the message that we're trying to get out there is really needed. And I appreciate you. You had a choice to be here or not. Uh, uh, you know, maybe some of you were voluntold. I don't know. Uh, but, but for the most part, everybody had a choice, and you are here, so I consider you my kindred spirits, and, and I really very much appreciate being in your presence. Okay, now, you know, if you look at value of engagement in the workforce, 
uh, there have been a lot of studies done on this topic and there are lots of statistics available such as these that I'm putting up that, that says it just really makes a difference. Uh, when you create a workplace culture of engagement and empowerment, it makes a difference on the bottom line. This is not just some touchy-feely thing, oh, let's make people feel good and let's all sing Kumbaya and all this kind of stuff. This is good for business. And by the way, it's good for people. Unfortunately, though, as uh, obvious this, as this should be and, uh, and as self-evident as it is, a lot of people don't get it. Like I, I speak uh, at events uh, in Europe, in the US, and there is a tremendous interest in this topic because people know, people, people really know that we need this. But when I talk to people, it's like, wow, let me tell you about my workplace. It's just exactly the opposite of this. So again, if you're in a place where you are just beginning your career and things like that, you are the future of our, you know, our workplaces. You get to go out there. If you're anything like me, I started my career when I was 23 years old. I looked like I was 16. I showed up at Procter & Gamble. I had a group of maintenance leaders reporting to me. They had all been around 20 years. I show up, I'm kind of a little bit timid, and they're like, this is your new boss. And people are like, oh yeah, <clears throat> okay. So I could tell these people, these poor people had been through that like so many times. Every few years they got somebody with no experience becoming their boss, right? So they had to put up with me. But what, what is really, really important to me personally, and I've made it my mission, not just my career, but really my life, is to spread the message that says, look, every one of us, whether we're just starting our career or we've been around for a long time and we just haven't been exposed to these principles, we owe it to ourselves and those people around us to really take this to heart and make things happen. So today what I want to do is I want to share with you some of those principles and, and things like that that, again, I hope that you will... Uh, find useful. There may be a few nuggets. Uh, if those are useful to you, take them. If not, just leave them behind. It's not a big deal. So um, when I spoke at the Shingo conference, I was so delighted. I have to uh, admit that I hadn't been exposed to Shingo for a few years. Many, many years ago when we were doing uh, you know, uh, quick changeovers and things like that, I had some exposure, but I, it was just really a very fascinating to me that, that Shingo over the last several years has really embraced this idea that culture is in the middle. It just makes everything happen. Uh, you know, It's not about gadgets and widgets and systems and processes. Those are necessary, but we have too many companies, too many organizations that go out and invest millions of dollars in those things and put them in the hands of people who really don't get what it takes to uh, create the right kind of culture. So we get uh, pennies on a dollar. Okay, so I was really, really delighted th to see this. And these cultural enablers leading with humility and respecting every individual, these are the kinds of things that I believe are, is the, this is the glue that brings it all together. Okay, so very much related to um, what we're talking about. So I'll make one request and I'll get into some of the, uh, you know, principles and, and beliefs and things like that. First thing is, I want you to, um, you know, this handsome fellow right here, uh, the picture was taken a few years ago. Um, I was managing a plant uh, that was the worst plant in the entire company. And we were doing a lot of different things and nothing happened actually uh, until I recognized that I was the, the barrier. So, uh, you know, I would really ask you if you're in any kind of leadership position or if you're going to be, to constantly look to yourself to see where you need to make some improvements. Because it's easy to look out there and say, okay, that needs to be improved, that, that person needs to do this, that process needs to change and things like that. But it's much harder to look inside of yourself. So I would ask you to declare yourself the barrier, the culprit, okay? And just listen from that standpoint. What, what part of what we're talking about today applies to me and what can I do, go do with that? You know, uh, Michelangelo said David was in the stone the whole time. I didn't carve out David. What I did was I chipped away at what was not David. And this is very, very true when it comes to, to leadership. 
Uh, you know, I, I think he stole my quote. Uh, he knew I was going to say many years later that extraordinary leadership is not acquiring more, more skills. It's about accepting accountability and chipping away at what's in the way. So if you really want to show up as an extraordinary leader, I, I think, and I'll talk about this a little bit uh, later, I think you'll find that most of our emphasis in leadership development is on putting something on you, giving you some skills, telling you what to do, telling you what not to do. Uh, whereas the, the real... Uh, the real prize or the real uh, return comes from you really figuring out what's in, in the way of you showing up as the extraordinary leader that you already are. Okay. Now, I, I put this together because I want to show you, in, at least in my mind, what I consider to be leadership requisites. Now, if you show up on any job or in any position, they are looking for you to actually know some things and be able to do some things, right? And, and if you, uh, you know, continue your career, you're expected to continue to get trained and educated so you can know things and do things. And what that does is that that makes you a functional expert, okay? So we continue to educate, we continue to train to enhance those things, okay? Now, if you really want to be an inspirational leader in addition to a functional expert, you need something more than that. Yes, you need to know some things. You cannot be incompetent. Uh, you need to be able to do some things. Those are very important. But you need another component. Okay? The other component is you need to be a certain way and you need to show up a certain way. You see, as a leader, it's not only okay to know some things, uh, but, but you show up as a person that people cannot trust. If you are being trustworthy, you get to really make an impact. If you're being dishonest, it doesn't work. So, so we, we've talked about basically the, uh, you know, to, to get to know things, we get educated. To get to be able to do things, we get trained. So where do we go when it comes to being? How do you, how do you be something, right? So there are a couple of ways you can do that. One is you generate yourself as being a certain way, okay? Now, uh, you know, uh, uh, this morning, at 6 o'clock in the morning, uh, at 6 o'clock this morning, um, I had to generate myself as the person you see right now because I went to bed at 3 o'clock last night or this morning, right? So sometimes you got to do what you got to do. And, and you can call it fake it till you make it or whatever, right? But, you know, and sometimes you have to do that. If, if I'm coming up here, I'm not, I'm not going to drag myself like, oh, you're like, oh, my gosh, this guy's going to talk. No, I'm going to generate myself, right? <laughs> Yeah, so I, I checked this with my uh, niece and nephew, the little ones, and we had gone shopping one time. We were at Walmart or something, and their parents were shopping, and these guys were like, oh, we're tired. We want to go home and stuff like that, and I said to them, I said, look, what if we go, after we get done here, we go to Toys R Us, and I'll buy you whatever toy you want. Immediately, they generated themselves, like right? <laughs> they were no longer being uh, the, uh, the whiny kids, right? They were all of a sudden energetic. Boy, they're like, but I, they said, wait a minute. Oh, I forgot. You guys are really tired. Maybe we ought to go. No, no, no. We're good. We're fine. Right? So how do you generate yourself? It's not only about faking it. It's about getting a commitment in front of you so that it pulls you forward. For me, there's, it's nothing. I can go with two nights with no sleep, and when I'm up here, I'm going to be who I am because there's a certain passion that drives me to generate myself. So how can you be a certain way as a leader? Accept that accountability and generate yourself. If you're having a bad day, recognize that you have a profound effect on everybody else, right? Now, you know, this is more of the short term kind of when you catch yourself, generate yourself. The second thing is you got to develop yourself into being a certain way. So over the long run, you can't just generate and you can't just fake it till you make it. You want to develop yourself into a leader who says, look, when this kind of stimulus shows up, I'm going to say, you know what? You're not going to drag me down. I'm going to be a certain way when I'm going to show up a certain way. You see, because that is what really makes a difference for the, the people around you. They pay more attention to who you're being and how you're showing up than what you're doing. 
There are a couple of training approaches. One is informative or what I call instructional. It has to do with you learning something and, and it gives you some tools. And this is by far the most prevalent thing that we do. Then the other one is transformative or inspirational, which is about you discovering something about yourself that's in the way and getting it out of the way. Now, I'm putting a lot of emphasis on this because I want you to listen from that place. Informative training helps you know things and do things, which is very, very important in most cases. If I have a heart surgeon doing surgery on me, I would like that person to have had some instructional training and to be able to, you know, I don't want him to just come in and be motivated to do a good job. I want him to really know what the heck he's doing, right? Uh, but the other piece, the transformative part, has to do with being a certain way. So most of what we're going to talk about has to do with this. So my final request to you is I want you to really focus in on gaining wisdom. This is not about a theoretical knowledge. I don't claim to know anything more than you do. This conversation is really aimed at making, causing a transformation for you. So my commitment to you is that by the time you get out of here um, today, get out of this session, that you will have found some nuggets in this conversation for yourself. And you're saying, man, I'm so glad I made it. To that session, right? Not like, well, it wasn't a total waste of time. It was all right, right? Now you got to figure out where you're setting the bar right now. Where are you setting the bar? Are you setting the bar like, eh, hmm, or are you setting the bar like, I'm pulling this to myself because I want to know. I want to be transformed. Now the good news, just to take the pressure off of me, you, that transformation is not going to come from me. I'm going to say some things, but I want you to listen for wisdom on things that apply to you. So if you accept my request there, we will move on to the next part. Accept my request? You can accept or decline, make a counter offer? No? Okay. Very good. <laughs> All right. So let, let's talk about the role of a leader as I see it. Okay. Th this is not, I'm not suggesting this is the end all be all, but this is kind of a, a, a thing that I put together. Now, this is a, a mouthful. Uh, but so I'm going to break it down just a little bit. The role of a leader is to create the conditions. The role of a leader is not to go make people do certain things, but to create the conditions in which everyone, not just some people, but everyone chooses. They're not forced to because they have to. Everyone chooses to be fully committed, not just a little committed when it's convenient, when it's easy, but I choose to be fully committed and actively engaged, right, in moving the organization forward. Forward where? Toward a common vision. Okay, so again, wh whether you're just going into the workforce or you've been around for 30 years, I'd ask you to listen and look at this message exactly as it applies to you and assess yourself to say, hey, where do I stand on this? How do I operate? Do we have a common vision? Are people choosing or are they, you know, are we just kind of beating them into submission and things like that? that these are great qualities uh, that, that leaders need to have. So as you, as you assess yourself uh, against these, I want you to think about the culture that you ultimately want to create as a leader. Okay, and I'll go through these real quick because I think they're self-explanatory and I did present these incidentally at the, at the Shingo conference. But I want, you to, I want to draw a contrast for you um, between the ideal culture and the opposite of that, which is pretty obvious. So stretching and energizing vision is ideal, shared by all employees. But having no vision, that's the opposite, right? But guess what? We're smart enough not to do the opposite, right? Because we don't want to look bad. Who wants to look bad? Nobody. That makes us look bad. Do you have a common vision? No. Oh, man, you're not a good leader. So what do we do? We do the counterfeit. What we do is we create a vision, but it's focused on solving a problem, not achieving the extraordinary. You see, our vision is not to be the worst this year. <laughs> How many of you are really you know, energized by that? We're not energized by that. So sometimes we play whack-a-mole with our problems, right? And we create these vision statements that are all about, you know, just not being totally, totally bad, right? That doesn't work. That's the counterfeit. Look, the next one, plenty of intrinsic rewards. And 
it, what does that mean? Extrinsic rewards are pay, you know, things that are tangible. Intrinsic rewards are things like a pat on the back, really showing people that I care about you, investing in their development and things like that. Ideal cultures have plenty of intrinsic rewards. They don't just rely on a paycheck to say, okay, I'll give you a paycheck, you better make th things happen. Opposite is only extrinsic rewards. The, the counterfeit is structured intrinsic rewards. Every Tuesday, every member of the staff will go out and pat somebody on the back at 10 o'clock. I mean, you, you, you might think that's funny. It is. But that's the kind of stuff some people are putting in place, thinking, okay, by golly, we're going to put some intrinsic reward. Then it loses, loses its meaning. When it's spontaneous, it works. Ideally, for, if frequent informal feedback between formal sessions. Formal sessions are awesome. But what you want to do is you want to have some frequent conversation in between. So by the time people are exposed to the dreaded F word, feedback that is, it's like, <laughs> oh, right? It's like, oh no, feedback. Because they know they're going to get slammed, right? So what do we do? We do the counterfeit. We do watered down, inauthentic informal feedback. We walk by people and say, hey, nice job. Doing what? What are you talking about? Rather than looking them in the eye and say, that report that you generated was just really awesome on you know, page 15. I have never seen that kind of analysis. Okay? Ideal, everyone on the court playing the game. Opposite, active sabotage. Counterfeit, people are often in the stands talking about the game, but they're pretending like they're talking about the game because they care. Right? Well, if you care, get on the court, make it happen. It's, it pays to be on the court and it, you know, it, it, it costs to be in the stands. Right? And we don't get that sometimes. And, and you, know, you may be criticizing the rest of the people in your workplace and things like that. In that case, you're in the stands of your life, of your, of your career. And that's what we're talking about. We drove this point home at my plant where we were the worst plant in the entire company on September 17, 2007. And this one piece of language really drove everything for us. Everybody was talking about, are you on the court? Are you in the stands? I'm on the court. And we immediately made this jump, which is unbelievable. Ideal, servant leadership, shared decision making. Opposite, of course, dictatorship. But the, what's the counterfeit? Benevolent dictatorship. Hey, I'll take care of you, but you better do what I say. But you know I'm nice to you, right? So that's the kind of thing that's the counterfeit. It's the paternal, maternal kind of leadership that we do. Okay? Now, uh, I did a, a, a servant uh, leadership survey on, uh, uh, in my plant uh, with all the, the people, all the leaders that worked in the plant. I told them three months in advance. I said, look, I'm going to send out a survey. I'm going to ask everybody to rate us from F to A+. Plus. And so this is not a popularity contest, but I'm just giving you a fair warning that we need to be servant leaders. And we got, we got a score. Mine, my GPA came out to be 3.53. I think it's a little bit inflated because some people probably thought I could recognize their handwriting. But let's just say I passed with a B, right? And everybody else got their report. I made my, mine public. But they got theirs saying, because I wanted them to understand where they stood relative to servant leadership and how people are perceiving them. So it's extremely important to do that. The ideal scenario is engaged employees at all levels. Opposite is disengaged and disempowered employees. But of course, there is also a counterfeit. The counterfeit is everybody's engaged, but only the in crowd gets the important stuff. Everybody else is doing busy work. Okay. And Next one, everyone is a leader and has responsibilities along with the necessary authority. They go hand in hand. Opposite is all authority is centralized. It's my way or the highway, right? But we don't do that. We do the counterfeit. We give responsibility, but we don't give the authority. Or we want authority, but we don't want to accept the responsibility. That's the counterfeit. High trust, low trust speaks for itself. Counterfeit is trust is extended, but only when the risk is low. Okay? So I trust you as long as I know you're not going to screw up too badly. But when the stakes are high, boy, I trust you, but hey, let me, let me get in there with you. Those are the defining moments when people know whether you actually trust them or not. 
collaborative multifunctional work teams versus silos. What's the counterfeit? The appearance of collaboration at the top. You know, we basically get along just like, you know, you see these uh, movies, you know, the two lawyers are in the uh, courtroom and they're just at each other's throat and then they're having drinks with each other and everybody's like, oh yeah, they're buddies, right? No, but in the background, they're actually, what they're promoting is a lot of adversity. So we have that uh, sort of appearance of collaboration, but we don't really push that into the organization. So just to share a few principles with you, uh, again, I'm going real fast. I'm, I know that I'm violating every rule in the adult learning uh, you know, world. Uh, but again, this is for you to just kind of pick some items from that really make a difference for you. So leaders, we already talked about, talked about this. The leaders must declare themselves the greatest barrier to progress and actively work toward getting themselves out of the way. Leaders must declare themselves the one. So if you're a leader and you're saying, I'm not the one, somebody else got to do it, then there's something wrong. So you got to start with, look, if, if it's to be, it's up to me. I own this thing, okay? So again, I'm not going to go through this uh, in great detail because some of you have seen it, but I contrast sort of change with transformation. Change has to do with standing in the present, looking into some distant future that you, and you don't know what it looks like, but you are very clear about the problems that you're facing today. So change has to do with solving those problems, plain whack-a-mole. But what happens? You solve one problem and you create another one, right? If you've ever listened to one of those prescription drug commercials on TV, you know very well what I'm talking about. What do they say at the end? It's not like you might experience some other pain. This will make you suicidal, right? It's like, wow, you know, it will make your headache go away. You won't have a headache when you pull the trigger, you know? But that's the thing. It's like you solve one problem, you create another one, right? And so we get into that cycle, and we, we all know that there's always something to be done, play whack-a-mole with, and we never get here. Transformation, by contrast, starts over here. It says, look, what is the ideal scenario that I want, regardless of my current situation? I'm going to stand in that future, and I'm going to look back, and I'm going to identify these things that must be fulfilled be it activities, milestones, and things like that. And I'm going to go through my day with the understanding that those are the kinds of things that I am going to protect. Okay? Now, another way to, to present this to you is, is this. We've all had some level of success in our lives, and, and uh, we've made progress, so we progress along the, the way, and we are here. Now, we still have some reoccurring issues and problems that are still kind of like that rock in our shoe when, you're, when we're running. You know what I'm talking about? You just kind of, if you don't stop and take it out, right, you just kind of put it dressed in the right place and you're running, and all of a sudden it shows up again right there in the ball of your foot. Oh! So anybody else have a reoccurring issue where you feel like you're running in a pool of molasses? Yeah, that's what happens, right? So you're right here. And you have a choice. You can continue to do the kinds of things that have made, uh, ca caused you to make progress. And guess what? You will make more progress, but it will be a, a new and improved version of today's reality. Okay? Or, as a transformative leader, what you can do is you can actually create an inflection point right here. And say, look, I'm not going to continue to do the same old, same old. Yes, I want progress, but I want more than that. I want to create the extraordinary. I want to boldly uh, declare something, and I'm going to go after it. But the, the only problem is you cannot see what you've got to do standing here. You've got to go over there, and this is what many leaders have done. So principle number two, leaders must declare a bold future into existence. These are some people who did that. They went out there, and they said, look, this is how it's going to be. And looking from there, they were clear that what actions needed to be taken. And you know what? You won't always be totally clear. Things will change. But if you continue to repeat that process, then you will create that inflection point. It's not about me. One of the issues that we face is that we make everything mean something about us. We don't want to declare something big because we say, what if I don't do it? I'm going to look ridiculous, right? 
And so along with I am the one, you've got to take on it's not about me. If you really give yourself to a cause that you deeply care about, you will literally disappear in your thoughts uh, in terms of they didn't do this for me, they didn't do that for me, but this is hard, I tried that, that didn't work. No, all of those things, you are in the center of all of that. So if you say, look, when it comes to this cause, whatever that is that, that you're passionate about, I am the one. And when that little voice says, well, but they didn't do this for you, and how about that? I say, thanks for sharing, but I'm a leader, and it's not about me, and we're going to move on, right? So you got to embrace both of these at the same time. This is a, a point that I, I, I really feel like it's, it's important for leaders to understand. I ask leaders all, or, all around the world, I said, do you know people who have an entitlement mentality? Does anybody here know people who have entitlement mentality? Yes, we know them, don't we? People are like, eh. I'm like, take it easy, right? So, yeah, we know them. But the thing about it is, uh, the worst problem to have is, and if I could just kind of invade your space just a little bit, I would say that you as a leader have an entitlement mentality. You think that those people owe you commitment. They owe you like coming to work saying, wow, boss, I'm just so happy to be here. What can I do? I just want to bend over backwards. No, they don't owe you that. What they owe you is compliance. You give them a paycheck and they're supposed to do their job. Beyond that, you've got to create some motivators to generate commitment. You own that. It's your responsibility as a leader to create the conditions in which people offer up their commitment for free. So if we embrace that, now I know, look, I, I, I'm not in some bubble thinking, oh yeah, you ought to think this way. I fall off the wagon every day. I say to myself, or my little voice says to me, you know, I know you preach that stuff and all that, but in this case, it doesn't apply. That guy is just a loser, right? I'm like, okay, all right, that happened. That bird flew over my head, but I'm not going to let it build, build a nest in my hair. Not only because I don't have hair, but just simply because it's just not right. <laughs> Some of these, uh, I, uh, I apologize. <laughs> so... Um, the, the most powerful, the one point I did want to make uh, with you is the most powerful thing you can do is listen to the language of the organization and, and understand uh, the implication of the, the language and shift the language. When we shifted the language from one of in the stands to one of on the court, it made a huge difference for us and we absolutely created a, a certain culture of positive action as opposed to whining all the time. So if you're participating in that, or if you hear that, you've got to make an intervention as a leader. So McGregor's theory, this is another one of my favorites. Um, basically, theory X says people are bad. They need to be beaten to submission. Theory Y says people are good. If they're not performing, something is in the way. Now, let me ask you again. How many of you know people who fall in this category? Come on now, let's be honest. You know those people. You know those people. How many of you are in that category. Okay, a couple of you have gotten some inside information, so you raised your hand. So here's the thing. Most of the time, nobody raised their hand. Those bad people never show up in my sessions. I want them here, but you guys are good guys, right? Now, if I ask you the question differently, most of you will raise your hand. I, if, if I say, how many of you behave that way from time to time? Right? But you don't see yourself as those kind of people. Why? Because you uh, judge yourself by your intentions. And you judge other people by their behavior, right? When you, uh, when you uh, act like that, operate that way, it's like, hey, let me tell you, that was justified, right? There was a reason for it. You don't understand. But when they beha behave that way, then you put them in that category. So principle number seven, leader's basic assumption must be that everyone wants to be part of something extraordinary. And if they're not, then it is your responsibility to figure out why. Now, are you going to turn everybody around? No. Everybody has a choice. You create the conditions. In some cases, they still make the wrong choice. That's fine. We've got processes, procedures, whatever, to make sure that we continue to entice people to make the right choice. And if they don't, there are some consequences to that. But you don't get to let yourself off the hook as a leader and say, okay, I guess that one's just a loser. No. You get to take responsibility. How many people in here meet 100% of their commitments? 
I'm the only one. See, that's why I'm up here and you guys down there. <laughs> now, some of you just got offended, but I was kidding. I was kidding. Just work with me. Remember those? That was a joke, guys. Okay. But I am very serious, however, about the fact that I do meet all of my commitments. Okay? So I have an exercise program that I only follow 50% of the time. But even when I snooze like seven times and it's time to go to work and I don't exercise, I'm meeting 100% of my commitments. Because my true commitment is to being lazy. You see, I say I'm committed to my exercise program, but my true commitment is to being lazy. Therefore, I meet 100% of my commitment and uh, commitments, and so do you, by the way. You see, because I'm not asking you about the things that you say you're committed to. We say a lot of things, but what are you really committed to? So you look around in your life, and I assure you, you will find that you are meeting 100% of your commitments. So when, when something is going on, I was having this conversation on the plane with a, uh, a lady who just kind of broke out into a coaching session. And, and it was like, hey, uh, you know, but I, I want to, you know, do some things out there in the community, but I'm not doing it. Well, why aren't you doing it? Well, because I have a lot of other things to do. Well, are you more committed to those? Well, I guess, yeah. So are you committed to this thing or not? Well, I guess maybe not. Okay, then just set yourself free. Look, there are a lot of things that I think are nice to do, but I'm not committed to them. I'll be straight. So... 100% commitment, not 99. That 1% will allow you to, to let yourself off the hook. And that doesn't work. The two questions I want you to remember at any point uh, in, in your leadership experience and in life, I dare say, you may not want me in your life. You can kick me out. That's okay. But these two questions really make a profound difference for you. It's kind of like setting you on the right path, uh, like uh, the GPS. What outcome am I committed to? At any given point in time, you can look and say, what outcome am I committed to in spite of whatever's going on? And the second question, what is the most important step I can take right now that I should take right now? Even when it comes to things that you don't have any control over, you will identify one thing that you can do, that you can go influence somebody who could influence that thing. A lot of times what happens is we let ourselves off the hook. We hit a snag and guess what? We use it as an excuse to get off track. I always say when you're on a diet, it's not the first bite of the brownie that does the damage. Guess what? It's the next six, right? So what you do is you buy, take a bite of the brownie, and you're like, oh, man, that's so good. Oh, I, oh, oh man, I was on a, on a diet for the last six weeks. That's why it tastes so good. Then you look at the brownie, it's like nobody's going to eat the rest of that, so I might as well finish that, right? Then you're like, oh, I fell off the wagon. I knew I couldn't do this. Might as well have six more. <laughs> right? Now, come on now. That happens to me. I know it happens to some of you. So we use that as an excuse. And all I'm telling you is, look, you took the first bite of the brownie, enjoy it, but drop the chalupa, okay? Just put it down. <laughs> That's it, all right? <laughs> and move on. So leaders must have the courage and tenacity to expect excellence and the consideration and humility to encourage and support their team members. This is very important. This is what I call the Chick-fil-A lemonade uh, example. You guys have Chick-fil-A here, right? Anybody have a Chick-fil-A lemonade? Oh, man, the rest of you have missed out. It's really awesome. Lots of lemon, lots of sugar. What does that mean? What does that have to do with leadership? Nothing, really. I just felt like a lemonade. But. No, really, it has a lot to do with it because the lemon is your courage and your tenacity as a leader. Your, the sugar is that you care about people and you express your, your caring for them. If you're missing out on any of those ingredients, you're either one of these bosses that says, it's my way or the highway, and if I want your opinion, I'll give it to you. That's too much lemon. Or you're one of these bosses that says, hey, I just want to be nice to everybody because I want them to like me, right? None of those work. You've got to have some of, some of each. So I'd really encourage you to embrace this idea if you leave with one sentence, one phrase that I think it, you know, sums everything up is, I am the one and it's not about me. And I want you to really get that if you get one part of this and not the other, it doesn't work. I am the one and it is all about me. You better get that. That doesn't work. It's not about me. And by the way, I'm not the one. That doesn't work either. But when you get both of these, it seems a bit paradoxical. But if you really, and I have a few more paradoxes listed in my book, that, but I really believe in the power of paradox. When you are able to embrace both sides of this, you see that you are a champion 
for things to happen and you don't make things mean something about you and get yourself off the hook. Just a couple more slides and we're going to open it up for some uh, Q&A. So you have a choice. But, uh, you, know, you could have the world determine your words or you could actually use your words to declare something in the world. Okay? Now, if, if you say, well, you know what, but my words don't really matter. And I'd say, absolutely, that is absolutely the wrong way to think. Because I don't care whether you have a high position somewhere or whatever. Somebody somewhere is looking up to you and they're really taking their cues from you. So when you declare something with your words, it really matters and it makes a difference. So you have a choice as a leader. You can be a thermometer or you can be a thermostat. Okay? You can declare, oh, this is how it is, it's terrible, or you could say, this is how it's going to be. So I would really, really encourage you to really embrace that as a leader. And as you can see, what we've talked about a lot is, is not so much a formula, go do this, go do that. But I'm really hoping that some of this is resonating with you, not to condemn you, but to compel you to say, look, if I really want to be a transformative leader, as I call it, what kind of culture do I want to create? What kind of mindset do I want to take on? What sort of foundational principles do I want to apply? And then, yes, there are some things you should do or shouldn't do. And incidentally, those are the chapters in my book. I uh, inadvertently, not really, um, put a plug in for my book. <laughs> but but really, seriously, that's the kind of thing that I really wanted, wanted to put out there uh, with this book. So I really appreciate it. I hope that you can, I hope we have a few minutes to, to have some conversation here. But I'd like you to join me on, on Twitter in the conversation. And um, uh, also just a couple of uh, uh, quick announcements that I wanted to make. We have a limited number of books available on the table outside. So if you would like to check it out, uh, purchase the book, you have a couple of options. One is you can stop by and we'll just uh, take a credit card, debit card, and we'll run that for you. The books are $16.97, and so you'll save on the shipping. But you also have an option in, in case uh, you know, uh, it's more convenient for you. You can actually go to amirganat.com and uh, use the... Uh, Use this code right here, which gives you free shipping, and we get the email right away, and you can just come and pick it up. Okay? So uh, with that, there's just one more announcement I will make, and then I'll shut up. Uh, we are giving away some uh, co uh, a free coaching session. So we have cards at that table where we have the books. If you are interested in participating in that drawing, please fill one of those out, and within the next few days, we'll get back with someone, and it's a 45-minute coaching session with me. Uh, some of you are like, that is the last thing I want to have. But, but, uh, but if you are interested, you're not, you don't have to. So let me stop here. <laughs> We've got just about eight or nine minutes for questions. So if anyone would like to start, feel free. I will try and make it over to you as fast as possible. Or you can meet me in the middle. Oh, yeah, go ahead. Yeah, th this was actually in my early days, 30 years ago, uh, when I first started my, my career. And uh, it wasn't, you know, like, I wasn't really ever a mean person or anything like that. But, but it was like, you know, sometimes people were, these people had 20 years of experience, and I was trying to micromanage them. Uh, you see, and, and there was, and later on I recognized that. I felt like, wow, you know, uh, if I had the experience that I have today, if I had the kind of wisdom that I have, gathered over the last 30 years, you know, all the little bit of it or whatever, I would have done much better. So I just had a great conversation with them and let them know, hey, that was my bad. Yes. Yes. Yeah, absolutely. So uh, Jim Collins in Good to Great really paints the picture of a level five leader uh, that says it's all about tenacity and humility. 
so, uh, you know, I don't know about you. I mean, so, you know, some of these iconic leaders that are really touted as like great leaders and all that, when you really dig in, you'll find that a lot of people didn't really want to work with them. Now, a lot of things went right with some of them. Some of them, I didn't, I won't name them. Maybe they were in the right place at the right time or they had a genius that said, look, I have this great idea for this product and no matter what kind of a, a person I am, that transcends all of that mess. Even though nobody wants to deal with me, I'm going to uh, still deliver this and that is great. But on a day-to-day -day basis, what I run into all the time is that most of us prefer to work with leaders, not leaders who let us off the hook but people who, leaders who really practice the Chick-fil-A lemonade style of leadership. They have the lemon, they have high standards, but it's not about them. It's about the mission. It's about the organization. Uh, so that's been my experience. Anyone else? Yes, we have a gentleman here. Yes. Oh, absolutely. I mean, so, you know, first of all, I have uh, many, I've had many failed attempts at many of these things that I tell you uh, about. So I'm not professing that I absolutely pra practice that. But probably one of the best examples of that is when I was trying to turn my plant around, uh, my bosses were absolutely against my approach because I was approaching it from a culture perspective and they were trained to say, no, you got to do X, Y, and Z. This is a bunch of touchy-feely stuff. I heard at one point through the grapevine that they wanted to fire me. They had actually put a package together to fire me. And uh, my response to that was, well, the heck with them. If they don't get how great I am, I'll just leave, right? Uh, and I seriously got to that point, but then I made a commitment to myself. I said, look, you know, this is not about me. I am here. If I leave, this kind of thing that has gone on for many years under the radar will continue. I truly gave myself to that cause. I was committed to really making a difference. And whatever was happening to me, I really caused myself to say, look, it's not about you. You're here for a grand purpose and you have got to fulfill that purpose. Yeah. Sure. It's very refreshing, by the way. When you actually get there, you let yourself off the hook with all the, you know, yourself beating yourself up and all that. You're just like, hey, I'm the one. It's not about me. Anyone else? Yeah. Um, is there in the book, do you talk about establishing culture? Absolutely. So, so there's, a, there's a section that, that ex, uh, explains what I call uh, or describes what I call a high commitment culture. And there are like 40 points that uh, are uh, presented in contrast with a traditional uh, culture. Now, all of those don't apply to everybody ev all the time. But if you go through those and you say, in my position right now, in my situation, with my experience, with what I'm dealing with, these five or ten apply then you really take that and you put that out there as I want to be intentional about creating that culture. Then as you read, uh, read on, then we talk about really if you are intentional about creating that culture, what's holding you back? There are some things that are hidden from your view. It's as if you're driving down the road and you keep pushing the gas pedal and you just can't uh, go any faster and somebody points out to you that you got your left foot on the, the brakes, right? And you're like, oh, my goodness, that's why I can't get, get up to speed there. So those are a lot of things that I point out in here, things that will cause you to begin the transformation process out there by transforming yourself, things that are hidden from your view. Thanks for the question. Anyone else? Yes, sir. So what you're looking for are what are those milestones that I must hit? So you see, on a day-to-day -day basis, we're so uh, sort of uh, preoccupied with today's issues to where we can't see the big picture, right? So I may, let's just say I want to get my PhD. If I'm standing in, the, in that PhD zone, I look back and say, I got to have my master's, then I, I got to have before that my bachelor's, then I got to do this. Now, today I may have a lot of problems. I may not have money to go to, to college and I may, all of that. But if I have that vision and I put those milestones or those requirements out there, this is what Stephen Covey calls the big rocks. You put the big rocks in first, then, then you deal with everything else. Now, sometimes those are not very clear. 
Because, you know, I'm sure when Nelson Mandela said, you know, we're going to do away with apartheid, he didn't sit back there and said, okay, here's what's going to happen. I'm going to go to prison for 27 years and I'm going to be president, right? He didn't know that, <laughs> right? I'm totally clear about that. So sometimes you got to be comfortable with ambiguity. But the best way you know how, just stand there and look back and say, what are the most important things? And, you know, you're going to have to renew that every time. And if you're truly committed to your cause, then you hang in there and you renew and you renew rather than getting bogged down with today's issues. Thanks for the question. Yeah. Yes, sir. I actually, you know, in my personal journey, I have never declared a finish line. Like, I'm there, right? But what you see is, are these mile markers that make you go, hmm, something happened here. In that plant that I spoke of, there was no uh, trust or anything. It took me several months to, to begin to establish trust, and I had to work on myself. How can I get myself out of the way? One day, I knew we had made a lot of progress. Not that we were there. One of my operators at 3.30 in the afternoon, he got off, and he came into this corner office, you know, my office, and, and closed the door and said, Amir, you're, you're, walking, you're talking the talk, but you're not walking the walk, right? And he gave me some homework for the next three days. Honest to God, he put me to work. He was right. I had, I had delegated some things, and I had not followed through. And so he put me to work for the next three days, and then he looked me up and he said, now you're on the right track. That would have never happened six months before. So that gave me a little bit of a sign that says, you know, we're moving in the right direction. Yeah, so the, the, the one other thing I will say about that, though, is that anytime uh, you are in need of some personal transformation, you have a lot of turmoil inside of you. But when you begin to be a bit more peaceful, not patient and okay, it was like, hey, no problem, but like I'm at peace while I'm tenacious then that's another sign for me, personally. Okay, I think we are out of time for this session. So on behalf of USU Partners in Business, I'd like to thank Amir for his time today. Thank you very much. Thank you. My pleasure. Thank you. Thank you so much. Oh, oh wow. Thank you so much. Very generous. I appreciate it. Thank you very much. And, and yeah, thank you. And I will be, uh, Nassim and I will be at the uh, desk. I would absolutely love any point that has resonated with you. Come by and let's talk about it. If you want to pick up a book, I'm happy to personalize it for you. <coughs> Thanks. <laughs> you know, I... I <laughs> Personally. Thank <laughs> you.